When the Egyptian revolution kicked off and ousted the regime of Hosni Mubarak, Nabil al-Arabi, a lifelong diplomat, was enjoying his retirement. It wasn't long before the new leadership tapped him to become the country's chief diplomat, tasked with revamping Egypt's defunct foreign policy. His blunt and straightforward criticism of the Mubarak regime's pro-Western foreign policy earned him widespread popularity in Egypt, but also raised concerns around the world. Many Israelis, for example, were alarmed when he pushed for the Egyptian border with Gaza to open up. But before he could really shake up his country's foreign policy establishment, Al Arabi was given yet another job. He was selected by the Arab states to be the Arab League's Secretary General. He inherits an organization that is already described by many as ineffective. And now facing the most significant challenges it has ever faced, including how to respond to popular uprisings against governments across the Arab world and how to manage the division of Sudan and the decades-old Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We caught up with the new Secretary General for a candid conversation about his organization's shortcomings, the challenges that lie ahead in the Middle East, and what he intends to do about them. I wanted to start off by asking you a little bit about the transition from the foreign ministry to the Arab League. Uh, there were many people who were speculating that you were somewhat forced out of that job for some of the comments that you made being moved to the Arab League, which is sometimes considered more symbolic, a little bit less in terms of its prestige. What's your response to that criticism? Well, uh, my response is that there was no pressure as such. Uh, the circumstances led to that. It's true that I would have preferred to stay in the foreign ministry and finish my public life within a few months. I didn't want to enter into a new uh, project uh, of such importance and the great challenge like the Arab League, which will continue for some years. The Arab League has a lot of challenges, particularly now. Uh, that's why I've, I started going from one country to another. I intend in the next few months to go to all the okay. Arab countries, uh, inquire from the leadership. But, but why, why did you accept the position? I mean, why? It seems that there was a little bit of a, of a power struggle in the sense that... No, no, no. The question was very clear, really. There, uh, there was a candidate, which I proposed his name. Uh, I think he's an excellent candidate, and he would have made a great uh, Secretary General of the Arab League. But there was some opposition for things he said or something of his past. Some of it true, some of it not true. I don't want to, know, to get into that because I don't know the answer. Uh, and uh, there was a date, 15th of May. We had to present the name before that. And the government thought that uh, I might be a, an acceptable candidate, uh, which it turned out to be true. Do you feel that the Egyptian revolution, having been there from the very, very early stages, has it stalled in the country? Do you think that it has taken a setback with some of the recent developments? First of all, I don't know whether I should speak on behalf of Egypt or not. I should not speak on behalf of Egypt, but I give you, since you ask the question, I'll give you an answer, uh, my own personal answer, no. Uh, take into consideration two matters, really. One of them is that it's very easy to change, to ask for a change, to destroy something. Change of regime, that's easy to, to attain. But what will come after that, it's always very difficult to build. Mm. This is the first point. The second point is that uh, all the countries, particularly in Eastern Europe, in Portugal in the 70s, who went through a transition, it took many years. I have seen four foreign ministers from Eastern Europe, three in one week, and they all made it clear to me that transition takes time. Uh, if you ask me now the question, do you think that you are on the right track? I say yes, for a very single reason. Uh, we are on the right track because what the, what the revolution asked for was democracy, liberty, social justice, and these are still the objectives and the goals that the country is moving towards, it will take time. And one more question. We should not that. lose patience. One more question about this before we move on to the Arab League and stuff. You were obviously on the inside of the transitional government. Do you think the transitional government led by Dr. Assam Sharaf and the military council in Egypt are serious about transformation and reform in Egypt? Yes. My answer is yes. And uh, I never considered myself in a transitional government. I just consider myself the foreign minister of Egypt. I worked for the uh, interests of Egypt. I tried to uh, take decisions, asked for permission to take decisions, uh, and tried to form uh, how the foreign policy could, sh should be uh, decided upon after uh, adequate consultation. Let's talk a little bit about the Arab League. You know, when you ask most Arabs across capitals in the Arab world, the first thing they'll tell you about the Arab League is it's 
highly ineffective, really mm -hmm. has no teeth, has no power uh, in the region. You are now the head of this organization. What do you plan on doing to change that perception in the minds of Arabs? With respect to the Arab League, uh, I agree that uh, the record of implementation is uh, poor. I would say that. Uh, whether we can change this or not, I don't know. I will try to do my best. Uh, the, uh, something has been added in the last few months, which is the wind, winds of change that has swept the Arab world. That, no doubt, will produce something else. What the something else, we'll have to wait and see. But people will say to you that the Arab League represents Arab regimes. It doesn't represent Arab people. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there ways to make the Arab League more representative of the collective will of the people? Can you have an Arab parliament? Would that be something you would advocate for? First of all, there is an Arab parliament. But on a it's a provisional parliament, uh, but it's going to, be, to change, I think, next year into a permanent parliament. But what you are saying, again, is a characteristic of international organization? Is the United Nations representing the people? It no, says at the beginning, we the people, but it's the governments who decide. Uh, no, 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 Let, let's be clear on that. But certainly government, the European Union no, no, is a more, is no, a no. more comparative... Yes, uh, this is something else, I'll come to that. Okay. Government decide in all international organizations as of today. Okay. Not the people. But the government should be reflecting the interests of the people. Uh, this is true. But so more it's, an internal, the, it's an internal matter in governments. Uh, but those governments as well, most of them at the United Nations, are considered to be at least major powerful ones considered to have democratic tendencies that represent... That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It has to do with the governments. Well, well uh, the Arab League doesn't have democratic governments. It, I'm sure it will. I'm sure. I mean, that's what I said. I mean, there yeah. is a wind of change which has swept the area, and we hope that it will, it will produce uh, more representative governments. That, uh, on that, I agree totally. So what are some of the challenges that you've inherited from your predecessor now in the Arab League? First, I have to say, in all honesty, my predecessor did a wonderful job. I mean, he was here for 10 years, Amr Musa was here for 10 years, and he built a lot of institutions which are there. What is needed for me is not to build new institutions, but to make sure that what the outcome of the decisions of these institutions are carried out faithfully. Such as what? Can you, can you give us some examples of? Uh, well, examples, let's say uh, there is a, a resolution here concerning the establishment of uh, an economic free zone. Yeah. I mean, don't look at the Arab League as don't look at the United Nations only with respect to the highly explosive political issues. This is one aspect of it. No, I think the economic free zone economic, is an issue that's yes, a, yes, it's on the yes. minds of many Arabs. They yes. say, why doesn't the Arab world have well, a cohesive ha economic on, on, zone? On, on, on paper, there, 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 there are uh, uh, documents relating to that. Right. But how to carry them out, this is, what, this is one of the challenges that I have in mind. It, what do you see as the obstacles for that being carried out? Are, sovereignty of states. Sovereignty it's very clear. Yeah. Sovereignty of states. States don't want to give up No, 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 they don't want to give it. But uh, anyhow, uh, I personally believe my point of departure which is the modern point of departure in international law, is that there is no, uh, no uh, such thing as absolute uh, sovereignty. Every country enters into every uh, treaty, loses part of its sovereignty. So at one time, uh, at one point, countries should realize that throughout the world, they don't have absolute sovereignty. Their hands are tied on many issues. Let's talk about some of the specific challenges now facing the Arab League. What is, do you think, the most pressing challenge facing the Arab League right now in terms of a geopolitical situation? Always Palestine. 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 Why? Because it's, uh, if you look at the history of the area and the history of the world, you'll find uh, 50 years ago there were m many countries under uh, colonialism, many countries uh, occupied and so on. The only people still occupied and the only people denied the, the rights and their most important right which is the right to self-determination are the Palestinians. Uh, whenever there is a, uh, let's say uh, some uh, uh, grave violation of human rights, let's say in uh, Myanmar, Burma, Burma, the whole world will stand and will condemn this and try to put pressure on the government to change it. When it comes to the occupation of Palestine, nothing happens. So it's the, the gravest and the most important challenge, test to international law and to international uh, justice. So it begs, it begs the question now, what are you, as the head of the Arab League, going to do about that? What's your plan for, for changing that discourse? We are planning to go to the United Nations because the, it will tell me what the United Nations will do. I'll tell you what happened yeah. in '47. There was a mandatory called the United Kingdom. What did they do when the fighting started? between Jewish uh, uh, immigrants and the Palestinians. They took the matter to the United Nations. So we're going back. 
going back to the United Nations as the British did in April 1947 and telling the United Nations uh, you have to assume your responsibility. That's being met by fierce opposition though from the Good. United right. States and no, others. No, no, they, no, say, no. they say that they don't want this issue solved in the United Nations. Rumors that the U.S. Why? is going to block it. They cannot block it in the General Assembly. They cannot block it in the General Assembly. But is it effective just to have a vote in the General Assembly? Well, you have to build your case step by step, file by file, paper by paper. Mm -hmm. So we, when we reach this step, we'll decide what to do next. But the general uh, uh, resolution taken in, uh, in Qatar, in Doha, a couple of days ago was to go to the United Nations, and then we'll see what to do in the assembly, what to do in the council, and we'll see what is the reactions of other countries. In your opinion, is the Israeli-Palestinian peace process that we've been living through now for nearly 20 years, is that effectively dead? It, it's, it was still born from the beginning. I don't believe, I don't use the peace process. And when any interlocutor with me, whether foreign minister or otherwise, will speak about the peace process, I stop and I tell them, please don't speak about the peace process. If you want to speak, speak about how we can attain peace, how we can achieve peace. Process, peace process has turned into process, 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 and that's exactly what the Israelis wanted. Okay. Let's speak a little bit about some of the specifics of sure. the region. The Arab League was uh, somewhat criticized uh, in terms of the change in position it's had on Libya. On one hand, many said it was used by the West in giving a green light for the no-fly zone uh, to provide a moral justification for Western military intervention in Libya. Then it came out and condemned the use of military force in Libya. But it's been very silent as well on other areas of conflict, including Syria, Yemen, and Bahrain. Is there a bit of a double standard in the way the Arab League is dealing with various Arab uprisings between Libya, Syria, Bahrain? First of all, let's make a distinction between a legitimate uprising of people against a certain regime and war. In Libya, there was fighting. There was fighting. I mean, you, we, we, when a uh, uh, government sends uh, planes to bombard the pop peaceful, I mean, not peaceful or not peaceful, I mean, civilians, this is a war. And uh, what happened here, I was a member of the, I was the foreign minister at that time, and I was a member of the uh, meeting that decided on uh, uh, requesting that the United Nations uh, carry out uh, uh, no-fly zone. Uh, at that time, all what we had in mind is to ensure that their stop, f fighting will stop. Uh, it's true, we did not look ahead much. Mm -hmm. But we thought we want fighting to stop, and we were under the impression that perhaps when fighting stops, the two sides will be able to uh, reconcile their differences one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, this didn't happen. Uh, the United Nations uh, took that resolution through and built upon it, built upon it, uh, for reasons of member states. I mean, I cannot decide on, right. the, on that. Uh, so uh, all of a sudden, it became bigger, and uh, the, the war had. Uh, had uh, other perhaps uh, more uh, devastating uh, results because mm -hmm. civilians died. So, so in hindsight, hindsight, everyone realizes. So in hindsight, do you regret that decision to authorize or to support the no-fly zone? No, I would not say I, reg I would regret it, but I would have had uh, requested, as in, if you go back to my statement, I, I asked for certain uh, conditions mm. for no fly zone, including uh, that civilians will be uh, spared, that mm. including that there will be a time, li time limit, uh, things of the sort. Uh, but uh, I will not say I regret it because I cannot, uh, as uh, I'm speaking here as a representative of a government, right. not as Secretary General of the United Arab League, right. as a representative of the government, I could not accept as a, a revolutionary government also, which has been formed uh, with a view to ensuring respect for human rights. Okay. Uh, action should have been taken at that time. I, I do not agree that. So today, do you condemn the use of force by NATO? No, I, I don't condemn the use of force, but I request that they should try to work more, as I asked so. when I was in, uh, in a meeting in Istanbul for peaceful solution, and everyone is speaking about that, about ceasefire and peaceful solution now. Okay. Um, you've just said that, you know, in, in the case of Libya, uh, it was the government using disproportionate use of force including fighter jets and military planes. We have seen other governments use fighter jets and their military against civilians, including in Syria, in Bahrain, and in Yemen. Why is the Arab League so silent about the use of military force by the Syrian government against its people, by the Bahraini government against its people, and by the Yemeni government against its people? Who took the decision to ask for a no-fly zone in Libya? Was the Arab League as such, or the ministers 
It's governments who decide that. It's governments who take such decisions, not the Secretary General. The Secretary General should offer his service. I did that in one trip. I was, I'm being attacked for it, but I did that. I went, I met officials, I told them that uh, you have to take into consideration the international uh, public opinion, you have to take into consideration uh, uh, that human rights are, should be respected always, you have to enter into reforms. I did, that's what I can do. So no, I, can, I cannot do otherwise. It's no, of course, I mean, I, I, understandable. Uh, so then in your position, why do you ask the ministers, why is there a double standard when it comes to how they dealt with Libya and how they're dealing with these other countries? I mean, people on the Arab street across the Arab world are saying that there's a double standard when right. it comes to how the Arab League is dealing with one country over the other. No. The, 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 uh, first of all, the scale of fighting or the, in one country is not like the other. There, is no, there was nothing at present like Libya. There are, there are others which should, could turn into something else. I'm not saying no. Okay. So I will not be surprised when they meet the Arab uh, ministers or they will, in September or when they meet earlier, they will decide on something relating to other countries. As for Yemen, you did ask about Yemen. Yemen, uh, uh, the Arab League from the beginning, I mean, I, I was not there, but I am following that path also. From the beginning, uh, found out that there are another sub-regional organization, sub-regional organization, which is working on it. Mm. So there was no need to interfere, and no one asked the Arab League to do anything there. Okay, you just said that you uh, took some heat for your recent trip to Syria. Yes. You made some very controversial remarks saying I don't know why. Well, let me tell you something here. Uh, I was asked a question. Okay. Uh, what was the question? But I'll tell you the yeah. question, of course. Uh, do you agree with what the Secretary of State of the United States has said about the regime in Syria losing uh, legitimacy? Right. My answer was in two points. One, I don't agree with any country deciding on the legitimacy of another. It's the people of that country which they, they, they decide on the legitimacy. That's what I said. And there is nothing controversial in it, but everyone forgot the second part. Okay, but you also came out and said that in your meeting with President Bashar al-Assad, you felt mm -hmm. uh, that he was serious about reform. He told me, I said, he told me he was serious about reform, and there will be reform before the end of the year. Do you believe that? I don't have to believe everything when I hear, mm -hmm. but I respect what I heard, and I will have to wait and see. It's not for me to decide. Well, you know, I think it's, when you, again, when you go to ordinary Arabs, they'll tell you that the pattern has been in these uprisings. You hear the leaders come out and say they promise reform. We heard it in Tunisia. We heard it with the President uh, Mubarak, and now we're hearing it with President Bashar al-Assad. Yeah. Uh, we, we, let me tell you this, but I will not get into more than that. Uh, we did go through the experience in Tunisia and Egypt. I'll stop there. This, was, this point was made very clear, but I will not say anymore. Okay. Did, uh, there is something called quiet diplomacy, and if you lose your credibility with leaders, you will never be able to regain it again. When, what happens in closed doors sometimes should not be in the public eye. Do you feel the leaders, I mean, you deal with the leaders of the Arab world, their ministers, do they get a sense that change is spreading across the Arab world, or do some of them still want to do business as usual? So m Many try to do business as usual, but maybe they should read the writing on the wall. Mm. What, what, is, what is that writing in your eyes? The, the whole area will be changed. But when, nobody knows. It might take 100 years. I don't know. <laughs> in terms of the conflict in Syria, how do you see that playing out from your position? I, what, I, I will not discuss internal matters, but all what I call for is respect for human rights for everyone and no use of force. That's but, all that I can say. But certainly you were there. You met with President Bashar al-Assad. Yes, I will not say what happened there. There's no way that you'll get me to say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you shed light on no, I mean, there, there, are, I there are innocent no. lives that are being lost yes, because of I this situation. I regret every innocent life. I regret the use of force. And I made that very clear. Mm. But I will not say anymore. Okay. Well, from, from your position of the Arab League, yes. besides simply just respecting human rights, are there any plans being put on the table to resolve yes, these conflicts? There are plans will be discussed later on. They are under study, but not everything can, could be revealed at this stage. Okay. Um, Recently, Sudan split into two countries, posing yet another geographic problem and a changing landscape for the Arab world. Yes. Uh, and some are saying it's paving the way for perhaps for even Darfur to split from Sudan. Do you envision that scenario? Darfur? That yeah, that Sudan will continue to be divided. Well, Is that a possible scenario? All what I can say that I was in Doha in the afternoon on, of the uh, 14th of uh, July uh, and I witnessed and I spoke in a meeting where the government of Sudan and uh, the majority of the Darfur uh, part, Darfurians signed uh, 
uh, an agreement that they will stop fighting and try to work together. Let's, let's give this agreement a chance. Okay. That was two, th th three days ago, four days ago. Okay, well, let me ask you then just very briefly about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict one more time. You're planning on going to the UN in September. Yes. Um, what can you tell us about the preparations that are being made for that particular vote? How far along are you in securing what you want to secure in terms of your own objectives? No, we already have a majority in the General Assembly. You're confident of that? Come September, you have a majority of countries that will recognize the Palestinian Oh, definitely, country. yes. Because there is no one really, very few, if any, will be able to vote against it. Mm. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, rules of procedure in the General Assembly says the votes will be counted up, uh, in, on the basis of those who are present and voting. Voting, that means yes or no, mm. not abstention. There will be some abstention, of course. There will be no by um, Israel and some insignificant countries, and uh, we don't know what the United States will do. Because the President of the United States has already said that he called for two states. So uh, the same birth certificate of Israel, which appears in the Declaration of Independence of uh, 14 May 1948, is the birth certificate of Palestine, because it's a resolution, partition resolution, of the General Assembly, numbered 181, which says that Palestine should be, should be partitioned between a Jewish state and an Arab state. Mm -hmm. So the birth certificate is there. Uh, and if you deny it, you are denying the birth certificate of Israel. It has to be very clear. It's being described as a very important symbolic gesture. It is. It's but, more, more than symbolic. But practically, what's it going to change on the ground? Nothing will change on the ground until the two sides sit on a piece, on, on, around the table and sign. Okay, but, but isn't that but taking no. us back to the peace who, process? Who, no, 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 no. Who will sit around this table? The state of Israel and the state of Palestine. So there's nothing against that. Mm. There's nothing against it. I mean, the ultimate request is to sit around the table and sign. But if you say uh, the objective is to get into negotiations without an end, uh, this is uh, futile. It will lead to, to nowhere. You are the foreign minister of Egypt. You made some comments that people interpreted as a rapprochement with Iran that certainly drew some criticism. That's certainly going to be a great cause of concern for Gulf countries, Gulf Arab countries. Is there a disconnect between... No, 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 let me, let me answer, because you said rapprochement. Uh, first of all, nobody knows, at least not many people know, that between Egypt and, and, and Iran now, there are diplomatic relations. I negotiated that myself in 1991. We have signed, establishing uh, interest section here and they're headed by an ambassador. Uh, the question which I was asked also is uh, whether Iran is an enemy, no. Uh, whether uh, Egypt accepts diplomatic relations with, with Iran, I said yes, because we do have diplomatic relations with Iran. With, when we will re uh, elevate it to full embassies, this is a decision that will be taken, I already informed the Iranians, that will be taken by our parliament. We have no enemies in the world. The previous regime said Iran was an enemy. I say no, Iran is not an enemy. It's just a country in, neighbor, in the neighborhood. We have the, uh, uh, in Egypt, I mean, in historical ties with, uh, with, with Iran. And uh, all the Gulf countries which you are referring to, they have diplomatic relations with Iran on the level of ambassador. But is that, th you know, it's described as a threat by some Gulf Arab countries, particularly in the West. It's seen as an Iranian threat. Uh, is no. that a sentiment shared by other Arab countries from your position as the head of the Arab League? Do you see it? Well, if they, if they consider it a threat, why do they have diplomatic relations with them? Mm. No, I, I, there's something every country will decide what is the threat to it. But the Arab League itself, no. I mean, uh, the Arab League had already uh, contact with Iran, contact with, with Turkey, with many, many very close contact, as a, fact, as a matter of fact, with Turkey. The threat of coming from Iran, which you refer to, uh, uh, emanates from the fact that uh, many, Ar many Arab countries uh, accuse Iran of interfering in their internal affairs. And this is matter is not acceptable. Even Egypt has some concerns on that, about uh, interfering in internal affairs. Mm. I do hope that this will be clarified and that uh, uh, the government of Iran, if they are doing it, they should stop it. Uh, is there substantial evidence of that? Well, the, uh, yes. I mean, some countries of the Gulf have their substantial evidence on that. Uh, I can wear the hat of, uh, of an Egyptian again uh, by saying, yes, here also there are some concerns in Egypt. I can say that. Secretary General, thank you very much for your thank time. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you.